Hi, this is Jeff Spencer, Math 135 instructor for the Community College of Denver, and this is a discussion about how to better understand why distributions can take one of the th three main shapes that we'll be studying in Intro to Statistics, skewed right, skew, uh, bell-shaped, and skewed left. These are the three main ones that we exam examine in Intro to Statistics, especially the bell-shaped one in the middle, which we'll call the normal distribution. Later, we'll give it that formal name. These are all distributions because whenever you look at a histogram or a graph like this, um, you can see kind of in the top one for skewed right, I'm showing really behind the scenes that there is some sort of um, histogram type distribution. And, and when we look at these, um, these, all these shapes, these three shapes, when we talk about distributions, all the variables that we're going to be examining are quantitative. So um, you'll see here that this is a histogram behind the scenes of the actual curve, which both really model what the distribution looks like and how the data is, is shuffled between low values and high values for that variable. Uh, one of the main examples, or one of the main distributions we will spend a lot of time with is on the bell-shaped or normal distribution. So if you think about like heights for 7th graders uh, with male 7th graders, then most, most kids are going to be towards the average height and you're going to have an equal number of tall kids as you will small or short kids. IQ scores tend to follow a bell-shaped distribution where more, most people are near the average IQ of 100 and then we have an equal number of people that are very high on that scale as an equal number that are, are lower on that scale. So this distribution is what we call symmetric. It's, it mirrors itself. But the skewed right and skewed left distributions are, are when we say skewed, we really mean the stretch in what direction on the right, so it stretches to the right. So how do distributions end up end up looking like this? So you have to understand that when when I ask you particularly like a question about on classwork two, if you collect a sample of hundred or sorry one thousand random U.S. residents and the variable is annual income. Would this distribution be skewed left, bell-shaped, or skewed right? And in order to think about this question, you have to think, okay, let's imagine that I actually collected um, a sample of a thousand data points, okay? So I'm not going to use income to start off with. I'm going to show that I'm just going to make a histogram. And let's say I sampled a bunch of hotels and I didn't give them real names. And I surveyed how many rooms they had. I looked at parking, pool, but really the variable that I want to look at for this histogram is the quantitative one, how many rooms this hotel has. So let's say I have a big data set, I'm kind of showing dot, 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 meaning that there's a lot more data that I didn't feel like, you know, I don't really have all the data, I'm just making all this up. Okay, so this is the, this is the variable, each hotel has a number of rooms. And let's say by the end, I end up having 600 some data points. Okay, I think for my graph it shows that I sampled 658 different hotels and I recorded the number of rooms that they had. So what I did was, since that data was such a long list with all these numbers, I decided to group them into classes because the number of rooms ranged pretty, it was a pretty big range from anywhere from like in the low tens or around 10 to almost up to 250. So this decision is made on your own. You have to look at the data Generally, you look at the maximum value, the highest number of rooms, and you look at the smallest number of rooms, and you try to break up that interval into about four to ten classes. Now, here I chose five, and I chose a class width of 50. So I started from zero to 49. I like to start with a nice zero on, on when I make my classes and end on a nine pattern. So you can see it's ending on a nine, and I'm always starting on a clean zero. So here I went by 50s. Now some people might look at this and say, oh, well the class width is 49 because each time you subtract these two numbers it's 49. But actually the class width is any lower value minus the previous lower or any upper minus the previous upper. So it's always going to be 50 here. Now the actual classes that I decided based on breaking this, you know, I've decided, oh, well the highest number of rooms was about 250 so we'll just go up to 250 here, basically 249, and we'll go down to zero. We'll break it up in fives. We have 50 class width of 50. So the actual classes themselves are 0 to 49, 50 to 99, 100, 140, 100 to 149, etc. Then here is the count, the frequency, of how many hotels 
in my list. So I had to go through here and look at all these numbers. I know they're not in there, but imagine like going through this and okay, counting, counting, counting. And it turns out that 138 different hotels, 138 different hotels had between zero and 49 rooms. Did the same thing for the next interval, counted how many and so on and so forth and got a total of 658 data points for my survey. So I surveyed 658 hotels. Um, this could be for a population of a bunch, you know, all hotels in a state or in the country. So I have a sample of 658 hotels. So my hotels are my individuals. The variable is the number of rooms. And then I uh, measured or counted, sorry, the frequency and computed the percent by taking all these numbers and dividing by 658. So you got to remember all those facts about how to organize data and that really that this stuff is coming from this, this is showing the variable. Well, what are the individuals? You have to go back and like, you know, usually that's given you to you in the problem, but here the individuals are hotels. And I looked at the variable, the number of rooms and counted them up. Then to draw the graph, really what I do is I look at, okay, if I'm doing a graph with frequency, then I look at kind of the highest number here and the lowest number here. So I range from, you know, just a little bit around those numbers from zero to 300 and broke it up into 100s. Then I uh, did the variable on the x-axis and I broke it up by the intervals, or sorry, the classes that I made here. Notice that you don't see 49 or 99. Typically when you make a histogram like this, you, you just show the lower end of the interval, the lower bound. So this is the lower bound of the first. This is zero to 49. The next is 50 to 99. The next is 140, 100 to 149, just like I have here. Okay, then finally, oh, well, you can see the class width there. Notice that this graph, if I were to approximate a curve to about the top of each bar, it's skewed right because it stretches out to the right, which means more of the hotels, most hotels had a smaller number of rooms and then we had a few hotels, not very many hotels, that had a uh, much larger number of rooms than the rest. The one I'm showing you down here is just the exact same graph, but it's scaled at percent. Generally, if you're comparing groups, I like to show percent, but if you're just showing one group by itself, frequency is, frequency is okay to show. But percents are you know, always easy to understand, and, and definitely when you're comparing groups, you would want to draw this type of histogram and compare with, say, another sample of hotels. So that's how it's created, and that's how you can look at, potentially, the shape of a histogram. So you have to really think about when you're answering this question, if I were to draw a histogram for this type of variable, how would it break down? Would most of the, would the high bars be at the beginning? So let's go back to the three shapes. If, if I drew this variable on the x-axis and then on the y-axis I drew, you know, big bars versus small bars, big portion of the population, small portion of the population, and I thought about what this looked like, what shape would it fit, okay? So this first one says if you collect a sample of 1,000 random U.S. residents and the variable's annual income, how would this really break down? So this is what I'm trying to think, okay, all right, let's draw, you know, here's... Eventually, I would draw like a histogram of this, and remember, income, I have to break up. Percent, remember, this is the size of the group, so this could be, you know, you could think of it as 0 to 100, but usually, if you have a bunch of different groups, the highest percentages are going to be, you know, could only be 10 or 20 or 30. So let's think about how we're going to break up income. So income is like what I think of this variable for a person, for a thousand random people, is what they make in a year, okay? So... I think that's what most people think of when they think annual income. This is what a person makes in a year. I'm sampling people. Okay, so how should I break up this axis? Well, I don't know. I think I think a good number to kind of differentiate is maybe by the 50,000. So that's what I'm showing here. What I decided was I'm going to go by thousands, and I'm just going to break it up into 50s. Now, I could do 30s or 10s to be more specific. But I want to do 50s because I want to get out to some really big out, uh, big incomes out here. All right, next, what I have to think of is, all right, if if I were to look at people who make zero to 49,000, what chunk of the population is that? Is it a small chunk of people or is it a large chunk of people? Well, based on my experience, most people I know, pretty much everybody I know, there's a, almost everybody I know, 
makes between somewhere between zero and like 100k as their annual income most people so i think there's going to be a lot of people here in this first bar and a lot of people here in this first bar and i'm just going to guess that you know it could it could be more in the first one and less in the second one but i just kind of guessed here that there's about 15 percent in this group and about 20 percent in this group but this is a, these are two really big chunks of the population. So this accounts to be 35%, like a third of the population. It might even be more. I might be wrong. It could be these, both of these could be higher and that this could be about 50% of the population. Um, it just really depends on the specifics, but I think actually in retrospect, maybe these are gonna be even higher. But the idea is, is that as I get to the higher incomes, there's less and less people. So some of you might know somebody who has, you know, has a really high income each year, but there's, there's less of those people. And that's how we start to understand that where are, most of, where are most of the individuals, which were people for this, based on this variable. Most of the individuals are in the small, the low values of this variable, and there's the small amount of individuals are on the high value of this variable, which therefore makes it skewed right. Okay, finally, let's just talk about skewed left, some examples that you see there because I've already talked about bell shape. So what type of variables would you see, uh, variables where there's going to be a lot of, a lot of the proportion of the population is going to be a high, uh, a high value of the variable and where there's not going to be much on the small. And one example is, a, it's, a, it's one where if we were to look at um, the age at death for people, so most people when they die they end up dying at a higher age than than younger people okay so that's one that you could look at another thing could be like maybe the individuals are high individual high temperatures for a day so each individual is a day and let's say we're looking at like a place like i don't know somewhere in arizona where it's it's generally kind of hot for that variable so the high temperature is the variable the individuals are days and they have a lot of high temperatures but uh, for a particular city but maybe it's a if it's higher up in the elevation that they can have a few really cold days in the winter but it's really not there's really not many of those days and most of the days are hot so it's just another example to think about but that's how you're going to answer these questions you have to understand that when you're deciding what kind of shape a distribution will look like you really have to think of like all the way from the organic process of imagine if I collected a bunch of uh, numbers for this variable from a thousand individuals, where would where would most of the individuals lie for that variable? With the small values in the middle, like heights, IQs, SAT scores, or on the high values, and then you can start to think about or make that decision whether you think it's skewed right, bell shaped, or skewed left. One final thing, for these three distributions, you do need to know that for, for like the bell-shaped distribution, that the mean, median, and mode are all right here in the center. I didn't have room to show that in the picture, but that's something you need to know. For skewed right, the mode is where the peak is, the median is very close to that, and then the mean, because it's sensitive to skewed data and extreme values, it, get, it's get, it gets pulled out to the right, so you notice that when I said here for skewed right, the mean is greater than the median. And that's true for, for income, because it's skewed right. And then lastly, for skewed left, it's the opposite of skewed right, where the mean, the, the, the mode is on the high end, the median is very close to it, and then the mean will be less than the median. So that since the mean is sensitive, it goes towards the skewed, towards the extreme values. So keep that in mind when, you, when you're thinking about these three main shapes of distributions for our intro to stat class. See you next time.